Hey everyone, this is Ian. Thank you so much for joining me on today's episode of the Empty Cup podcast. You are living in the world where modern and traditional martial arts collide and we dissect what is left over. We look at it and, uh, you know, give it a turn and say, hey, you know, what works, what doesn't work and look at different people's paths and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, just good martial arts talk. And today is going to be no exception. I'm very excited about the guest that I have on. I actually got to study with this guy. Well, I can't remember. Was it, was it last Saturday or was it the Saturday before last? Last last Sunday, I believe. Last Sunday. Yes. Yeah, something like that. Uh, and it was something that I wanted to do for a long time because I've been doing, you know, jujitsu on and off. And uh, I've really, really been uh, a big fan of 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu for a long time. But there's no 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu places uh, here in town, and uh, the coach at our at our gym finally, you know, did a, did a seminar and brought you up, and uh, and we did a seminar, and so I want everybody to meet you, and uh, and want to thank you so much for that amazing seminar, and tell us. Well, I'm going to go ahead and let you say your name so I don't butcher it. Go ahead. Sure. My name is Gregor Strockel. And I, I think if you're a 10th Planet guy or you are uh, any type of jiu-jitsu practitioner, um, you know exactly who I'm talking to. He's won just a bunch of championships. He's very good. And the leg lock seminar that we went through uh, was amazing. I mean, it, it literally raised my game uh, quite a bit. And it's kind of funny because, you know, leg locks are like one of those things that people either love them or hate them. You know what I mean? It's like right. you either love leg locks or hate, but you know, you either go to school and they're like, ah, you know, I hate it. But the school that I came from actually really, really liked leg locks, except for um, the 10th planet leg locks are kind of like a, kind of like a, like an upgrade. You know what I mean? It's kind of like going from windows 95 to windows 2010, or whatever, you know? Um, so let's get into uh, your journey in the martial arts. That's what I like to focus on. So tell us, Greg, uh, a little bit about like when you started in the martial arts, uh, what, how old you were, what styles you studied, and what led you to where you are today. Yeah, so, um, you know, so obviously for the audience, I grew up in Europe, so um, I didn't move to the United States until I was 21, um, but I started martial arts when I was six years old. Um, my dad had a, a studied extensive judo background. He tried out for police force a couple times, and and I was a huge fan of Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee movies ever since we got our first VCR. So it's something that I wanted to grow up and be a Shaolin monk. So um, I started with uh, judo and karate as a child at six, went on till about nine or 10, and then switched over to Japanese jiu-jitsu uh, in a gi. And then I came across um, a flyer for Wing Chun Kung Fu that just came out to, uh, to Slovenia, a country I was growing up in. And, uh, you know, I, I knew from having studied Bruce Lee's background that that was his art that he originally started in. So did that from 14 all the way through 19. Um, I had a, a very good coach, Robert Lisat, who was also a, a Swiss champion in judo, um, who was my coach. And so, um, and that was right at the time in like the, the mid to late 90s. I graduated high school in 2000. And it's when we started seeing first UFCs, but because we had such an eclectic background of different martial arts, um, and my my coach, my Ju Wing Chun coach was a judo champion, he sort of fused the traditional and the, and the new together, if you will, because Wing Chun really, if you think about it, even though it's practiced in a very unpractical manner sometimes, you know, with the wind yeah. up and things like that, it was really the first time we thought about distances, meaning you practice you know, the sticky hands, the low kicks, um, by low kicks, I mean below the belt, uh, sticky hands, elbows, knees, and even some ground combat, even though it didn't go very far past, you know, hinted elbows yeah. and, and knees. But it was kind of first time we sort of started breaking fights in ranges. And then UFC came out and, um, you know, Slovenia has a couple of really good champions. Gosh, Petziner, who was a Muay Thai champ, uh, world champ. We had the... Uh, Barada, who was a, a world Taekwondo champ. And so it was just a bunch of young kids, martial artists, that tried to put different styles together. And I remember being the Wing Chun practitioner wow. and you know, trying to chase boxers hooks this way. And so it was just this mecca, you know, of trying to figure out which art was better. And uh, because my coach had competed at the European level, 
he was a good coach. He also went to uh, university. Um, we call it a uh, sports university. He was basically coach to be a professor of PE in college, if you will. And so he was right. able to break it down and apply those judo principles. And so that's how the early MMA was born. Um, and so we started, we switched from Wing Chun in the late 90s to uh, exclusively what we called Vale Tudo at the time. And then in 2001, I met an American and moved to the United States um, and went to BYU, trained with Ricky Landell for a little bit and Pedro Zauer. Um, and then I graduated BYU in 2005 and moved to California and started training Gracie Jiu Jitsu originally. Um, okay. Then back to MMA. Um, and owned my own gym for a few years. Um, and then when I turned 30, I uh, started competing Jiu Jitsu exclusively and just focused on that without the head talk. So I've been around uh, quite a while about different arts and stuff. I focused exclusively in boxing in college in Europe for a couple of years too. Um, so I have a, a background in various arts. Yeah. That's so awesome. That's, 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 really, background, yeah. that's really incredible. So, but you do 10th Planet Jiu Jitsu now. Right? Or well, I'm sure you don't do anything exclusively because you have an eclectic yeah, background. Yeah. Well, so so my journey to Tenth Planet is a unique one. So I started. Uh, well, I mentioned I owned a, a, a gym in the Bay Area, trained in gi a little bit. Um, but you know, having grown up in different arts and and having been from Europe, I sort of gravitated towards uh, leg locks. And you know, we we had some sambo friends, and so that was kind of what we were going towards. And in in the, the mid 2000s, leg locks were really frowned upon, especially in the gi. And I mistakenly reaped the person a couple of times. You know, for those of you who didn't know what reaping is, it's really pushing the foot past the, the hip line. And so um, I almost, I got yelled at, you know, as a white belt by the instructor. It was just really not mm -hmm. a professional setting. And a friend of, uh, of mine was training in San Francisco. I lived in East Bay, which is about 30 miles out. Went to San Francisco, and Danny has always been very open-minded. And welcomed me to the gym, and I never looked back. And it's been probably the best journey I've done. Um, it was just, you know, a lot of Ten Planet associate, um, or some folks associated with, you know, um, with Eddie, and 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 obviously that there's a component of that. But but there's also a uh, a metaphor for being open for for exploring what works and rejecting a lot of like what Bruce Lee talked about. And that's what made me. Yeah. It was they were like, wow, you gravitate towards this, so take this and that, not like, oh, you shouldn't do this because we figured it all out. So that's why I ended up at Ten Planet. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, work, working with Denny um, Prokopos, so Eddie's first black belt, Adam Sachnoff, who was an uh, ADCC trial winner, um, and he is uh, Denny's first black belt, and also Alex Kanders, um, who is also one of Denny's black belts, and so, so that whole group there. Um, and then, obviously, for my old executive job, um, I uh, went to Utah, Salt Lake, and so I trained at the University of Grappling as well, adding uh, wrestling into the mix of things. So uh, the way I look at it, I'm learning the top jujitsu and then learning the best off the, off the bat. So um, kind of both. Yeah. yeah. So you, you said a lot there that I certainly want to um, to talk about. Uh, but one of the things what that you said was, is like a lot of the, you know, leg locks were frowned upon. And I remember the first time I ever went to a jujitsu school. Well, that wasn't the first time I went to jujitsu school, but the first time I went to a jujitsu school to learn, to actually mm -hmm. learn jujitsu. I came from, at the time I was doing, I was doing Russian martial arts too in Sistema. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were going through some basic like um, leg locks uh, from Sambo. It was very, mm -hmm. it was Sistema at the time was very uh, Sambo influenced. And uh, I w and I went to and actually it was Sistema that actually got me into ground fighting. You know that mm -hmm. was the the one actually one of the few things that that I enjoyed about Sistema was that it got me into into ground fighting because they at the camp I went to for some reason they just decided to focus a lot on the ground and mm -hmm. we were fighting on the ground a lot. And then I went I came back to the states and um, my my JKD mentality took over. My JKD mentality is, is who's already doing this and who's the best at it. Right. You know, that's that that was it. You know, I didn't I don't need to develop it myself or whatever or whatever. I'm like, you know, so I was just like, there's a Gracie jujitsu place here in town. And it wasn't the instructor who did it, but I, I was rolling with one of the blue belts and I threw a leg lock on and he got he didn't like get really mad at me, but he basically told me like well, we don't, you, you shouldn't do that because you could really hurt somebody, basically. Mm -hmm. And I was like, 
well, all these moves could really hurt somebody if you do right, them. Right, right. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, that's what you got to tap for. If you, you know, that's that whole idea. So, right, um, absolutely. I, I kind of want to explore that. Maybe you can kind of give your perspective on the shift from um, leg locks, and it seems like that's not, you know, like I'm not alone in that experience. Mm-hmm. That there was this time where you know it kind of looked like leg locks were not like in vogue to being the hot thing and then kind of somewhere vacillating people vacillating in the middle what what's been your journey with that yeah, and I mean, how do you see the community the the jiu-jitsu community on leg locks well so for me um i think it's it kind of I, i've sort of done i like to say i've done leg locks before they were cool or um uh, so i look at it very simply the body has um, has a head, two arms, and two legs. And those are conversely the five things you can submit. So uh, I agree with Dean Lister wholeheartedly. There's a lot of people that are really good um, from the belt up, their black belts uh, above the waist and white belts below the waist. So I think leg locks definitely go ignored. Um, I have a, a probably a slightly different view on the leg locks than uh, than most people. But, but here's the thing. So I think if you look at jiu-jitsu and MMA and how it came about, uh, leg lock in itself can be an effective tool, and Paul Harris and then Lister and, and a lot of other ha- uh, fighters, Ryan Hall, had a great, great success with them. But fundamentally, you are falling, maybe not your back, but you're falling to the side, which potentially you could give up position. There's a slippery factor. So I think in MMA uh, or jiu-jitsu for MMA is, is heavy based. You want to land strikes. There's a lot of control. So you see, from that perspective, you see a lot of leg locks, right? Or sorry. Uh, a lot less leg locks because of that top pressure. I think if we look at historically how jiu-jitsu came about, um, you know, it was tested in UFC one and two and three and so forth. So I think there was that Gracie's, you know, we've we've piloted this, we've proven it, this is our way. But I think as increasingly people started cross training and added other uh, other aspects of things like sambo and wrestling came into play a lot more. And as people became better athletes all around, like George St. Pierre and some of the other guys. Uh, they started looking for tactical advantages, and I think like leg locks were underutilized. So that's how they came about, I think, um, more so. Um, now, I know if you read historically, there's the whole Fada and the Gracie thing, and I don't want to get too much into history. And then I think, um, so So there's a lot of that. You know, a lot of people jumped on the Gracie bandwagon and did it tons to the sport. And, and I think they followed down that lineage and spent a lot of time upper body-wise. Um, and so, uh, you know, and then I think um, as other athletes started having success with it, you know, I, there's stories of Dean Lister teaching this to uh, John Danaher in New York, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and as you know, Danaher Death Squad has great success with it. Eddie Cummings, Gary Tonin, uh, you know, uh, Ryan, uh, Gordon Ryan, all of those guys. And so I think it comes in waves, you know, I think I think that got added on. And then with submission right. format, uh, you know, they're proven effective. I mean, it's great equalizer, uh, you know. Yeah. The dirty thief, right? Because it, because it's <laughs> and I think um, here's my unique philosophy. Here's where, so I think that's how they came about, you know. And now people are realizing that you need to train them. Um, what I what I kind of see happening is I still think the best jujitsu is heavy jujitsu, pressure jujitsu, uh, gravity, mass you know, uh, tiring the opponent out. So, so I think, I think that's the, 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 the top, top control is what you want. So, Mm -hmm. so I think what, what's happening now because of resurgence of EBI and all these leg locks and heel hooks coming up and everything else and variations and saddle and cloverleaf, there's a lot of white and blue and purple belts that are doing a lot of leg locks. And I think what that can create is this, it's a negative feedback or a, sorry, a false positive. So what happens is, you know, if, if you're a blue belt and you're strapping on heel hooks on other blue belts, great. That's awesome. You'll catch them. You'll probably catch some purple belts and occasionally probably a brown belt and, and, and things like that as well. But but you're developing some habits that will only get you thus far because you're not developing other attributes that okay. are required to compete with the best at brown or black belt level even. So you might be, you know, you're going for leg locks because they work. But but a blue or a purple belt isn't given isn't going to give you a proper response or a high level response that you need to be able to develop the, the pressure to hold the person down at brown or black belt level. So I see you know I see I look at Instagram sometimes and 
you know, it's, it's people posting variations of variations, you know, there's still leg locks are great and they're an important component of the game. But, but I, I absolutely think you need to develop other aspects and then, and, and then combine them all together. So, you know, yeah. that, that's where I, I, think, I could. I think too, that it's getting, you, you always have your outliers on one side, you have like the, 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 the pro leg lock group. Like we focus on leg locks. It's a big mm -hmm. part of our game. And yep. then you have the people on the other end who are like, you know, leg locks, don't do them. You know, we hate them. And then you have this large group in the middle. And I think it's kind of overall, the, over the, the, the spectrum, it is leg locks are now like kind of like tolerated in most schools for the most yeah, part. Yeah, I mean, like, I think if you look at any system in life or in nature, right, whenever, whenever we isolate we don't profit as a society, right? Whether it was China building up the walls, it's only in sharing of ideas that we that we come together. And so, you know, I, listen, I compete at IBJJF and I compete no gi submission only events, right? So, um, I think I think that definitely the dialogue has gotten better. And so, what's happening is now people are cross training a lot more, and they're at least aware. Like, if you're a black belt, in my mind. Sure, if you're IBJJF specialized and you're into rankings and all that, that's great. You you have you know toe holds, knee bars, and and uh, straight ankle and a lot of other stuff you can do. But you should still be aware of heel hooks that they exist and that they work. And you should be able to intelligently defend them, right? So you should know it's out there. You can't just isolate. So I think as the jiu-jitsu community comes together and recognizes that things work, right, and cross trains and are aware of them, look. I, I'm 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 a no gi guy, right? I still put on a gi to help my friends train, and recently even did some competitions. But I'm strictly no gi guy. It doesn't mean I don't put it on. Uh, you know, I like right. to talk about when I was in Australia. I guess what I did? I drove on the other side of the road. I wasn't the best at it, but that's what I drove, right? And so I think, I mean, for someone to say that leg locks don't <laughs> work, I think is an absolute. Uh, it's almost idiocracy at this point, you know, like the movie. Right. So uh, now, do I think you need to go off the deep end and train only that? No, it's only going to get you thus far. But I think you should be a well-rounded jiu-jitsu person. And I think anytime someone goes, we've invented it all and we're done, and that's the only way there is, I get very suspicious about that, right? And so, yeah. you know, a lot of a lot of old things are becoming new again, you know. And in fact, I, I saw this the other day. There's even a picture of Helio doing heel hooks in a gi. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, way back, and there's like Colson judo videos of people doing uh, Twister, and you know a lot of stuff that uh, Eddie is famous for, which is actually just the wrestler's guillotine. So it's just it's uh, you know it's it, it's very interesting. But I think as people yeah, call I, mean, it, I, I don't know where where it came from that it was like taboo because like if you looked at like you know early jujitsu, it 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 wasn't like focused on, but they had them. You know, they had like a basic leg lock and leg lock escape. And for some reason, it just became, which is crazy because it's just like jujitsu came out, Brazilian jujitsu particularly came out and shattered traditionalism. Yep. You know, it's like, it's like, like there's these traditional fighters and they were like, okay, you know, my karate is better than your kung fu. And then you had jujitsu come out and just destroy them all and say, look, you know, and, and it was a Brazilian jujitsu. It wasn't Japanese jujitsu. It was, it was a modern, it was a modernized, it was a mm -hmm. step forward. But then that became frozen. It was like, no, that's what we do now. And we're not well, going to move the market was, It's tried and true. We battle tested it in the beaches of Brazil. And we, we did it in the cage in UFC, UFC 1, UFC 2, UFC 3. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. But then it's like you said, it's frozen or the evolution stopped. That's it. They've invented it all. And Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is now done and it's packaged and here you go. Now you can get an online blue belt. You know, right. I, I, think, I think that happens with all systems when they get to a certain size or a critical mass because it's, it's marketing, it's ability to sustain an income and provide for a family. And so I get it, but I think you have to be, you know, I, I mean, here's the thing. If you independently put a lot of people together eventually and expose them to the similar problem, they will derive to a similar solution, right? And so, uh, and I think, I mean, look, that's why resurgence of traditional martial arts comes around, right? So I was saying how I was chasing you know, trying to catch a boxer's hook with, you know, my Wing Chun stuff. And it, it, it didn't work because it was a short hook and it was set up, right? And, and and so what happens is, you know, traditional martial arts provide a lot of great things. Meditation, uh, focus on technique, focus on oneself, focus on breathing, focus on a lot of those things. 
And those are all important components that a lot of high level athletes are doing right now. They hire psychologists, they have sports coaches, they focus on breathing people in Jiu Jitsu tell you breathe. So those are all things that are important, right? Meditation, introspection, a positive outlook, all those things. But if you only do those things and you never spar, it doesn't work either, right? So, right. so we've, kind of, we've come a full circle, uh, you know? Uh, so, so all those things that peak performance, you have to eat right, you have to work out right, you have to have a positive outlook, you have to do all those things together. As a person. You just can't do anything in isolation, uh, isolationism. And so I think whenever someone goes, we figured it all out, um, then the same techniques would still be, uh, you know, working that worked in UFC 1 and UFC 2 would still work today, but you had Butterfly Guard, De La Hiva Guard. I mean, it's like, you know, keeps, you know, Eddie Bryan, it keeps, it keeps coming, you know, and so evolution cannot be denied. So for, for you, mm -hmm. personally speaking, how much, um, how much of your game is, uh, is, a, is a leg lock game? Would you say it's like 50%, 25%, 70%? You know, um, well, here's the thing. So, so I think, you know, I developed a pretty decent jiu-jitsu game, but the way my mind works in my old job, I had an executive profile, which there, there was an interesting insight into me, which you spend a few hours with a psychologist. They gave you feedback on me. I'm going to bring it around, but you basically said, Gregor finds very little need to innovate unless his accustomed ways are not working. So I feel like I've always, uh, you know, as a foreigner coming, learning languages, you know, or, or observing society, I've always looked for why are things the way they are and how do they work and what's the optimum solution now. So uh, at Blue Belt and Purple Belt, I've won IBJJF Nationals. I took second at IBJJF Worlds, all with the straight ankle lock. It, I had like, I think a string of like 21 or 22 victories, all straight ankle lock. And so, wow. so I think, at that point, um, pretty much, I mean, I would say like 70 or 80% of my game was leg locks. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I moved to Utah and uh, I got promoted to Brown Belt and, uh, from Denny and uh, I went to Utah and, uh, you know, I, I uh, you know, rolled and obviously Utah compared to California, there's, there's, a, there's a little bit of a gap in terms of skill, but I, I came across University of Grappling. I knew Ricky Lindell had promoted first black belt. And uh, man, I could not get underneath Mark Brewer. I couldn't get I couldn't get him off the mat. It was such an impeccable balance. And I realized kind of about that, that what we talked about, is it'll only get you thus far. So I had to develop uh, other attributes like top pressure, heavy passing, so that as, as I pressure, people try to regain guard, which means they scoot, they bring their foot in, which is how I grab it, and I get to it. So then I actually found that my, my foot locks feed my passing, and my passing feeds my foot lock. So I, I'd say right now at Brown Belt, I'm probably looking at the last 30 to 40 matches. I'd say, I'd say about 50% I finish with a, with a foot lock. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I'd say it's about half and half, you know, um, and okay. it's simply with the matter of the fact that people still aren't used to them and I've been doing them so long, um, mm -hmm. that I just, if it's there, I take it. Right. Um, right. Right. So, so I'd say about 50%, but there are some tournaments that are smaller where I focus in and I will not do a single footlock and I'll just either try to outpoint or work on a specific technique. But if yeah. it's tournaments that matter, then it's footlocks. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Well, that's, that's interesting because you get used to something and you get good at it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and if it's available, it's like, why not take it? Who cares yep. if you've done it like four or five times before? I mean, if you're in a competition and it said it's yeah. presented to you and you're good at it, do it, man. I mean, that's, that, uh, that's one of the, the, well, that's yeah, one of I the think, things that. Well, yeah. And I think as I get older, right. The, what I'm realizing, there's two components to jujitsu, like, if it's a tournament that matters to me, that's important. Like EBI trials was important to me, right? I, I lost in uh, quarters, but uh, it was just an honor to be there and be invited. But obviously that's a tournament that matters. And so why go reinvent the game? Why do something that I'm not used to doing? Why? Right. I have a game. But in off season though, if I just keep sticking to my game and only doing my game, I'm missing out on all this other beautiful stuff that's out there. And so, when I'm not in competition, I make sure I expose myself to other aspects of the game that I don't do so that my jiu-jitsu grows and then focuses on, you know, when I'm competing, I do my game or mm -hmm. it's really jiu-jitsu at the highest level. 
everybody can submit everybody, you know? So what happens is the person usually wins who can funnel the other person to their game. Mm. That's really what it is. Everybody's good at the highest right. levels, which I'm not at the highest of levels. I'm not by any means. But if you look at it, it's, I mean, all those guys are good. And there's, there's rivalries, right, where people are two and two or two and one. And someone's won, someone's lost, and then the other person won and lost. And it really comes down to a quick transition, a quick something that they just missed. And, and that's it. It doesn't mean the other person's game is weak or anything. So it just, um, so yeah, so I think, I think that's important, you know, with, with anything in life. You have to grow it out and then do what you do, you know what I mean? Right, right. No, I get it. I get out, you know, and I'm still fairly new to to groundwork, you know, mm -hmm. and, and when I'm sparring with somebody, I don't, I don't want to go to the ground. I'm not good enough yet, you know, to go to the ground. Sure. If I want to win, I got to stay on my feet, you know. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean that I don't practice ground because I want to get better at it, you know. Sure, That's absolutely. Doing yeah. jujitsu right now. And I've noticed, I've noticed, you know, even in the, well, probably about two years altogether um, that I've been doing jujitsu, I've even noticed some strengths and weaknesses in my own game. You know, it's just like, okay, I know that I can, I can get this submission real, real well, like a lot of times, or I can do this guard pass real well a lot of the times. And so when I'm rolling with somebody, if it's presented to me, I will do this particular submission or this particular yeah. guard pass or whatever. But it's just like, okay, I did it and now I kind of want to I don't want that to be my only thing that I can do but right. you know but it works really well for me so it's one of those things I heard this said a long time ago and I've repeated it before in the program and it's cross it doesn't matter which art it is it's true it's like basically you can get to a pretty high level on your strengths you, you know you can get to a good purple belt on your strengths it's mm -hmm. really hard to get past purple belt unless you unless you address your weaknesses though right Right. Uh, and that's the same with with JKD, with Wing Chun, you know, mm -hmm. with any of the other arts that I studied. You can get to a pretty high level just on your strengths alone, on what you like right. to do and what you're good at. But you get to a point where you break and it's just like you got to address your weaknesses at that point in order to get get beyond it and get to your black belt. Well, it's like it's like what got you there won't get you, you know, what got you here won't get you there, right? But I think right. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the good thing about jujitsu and uh, like most things in life, it can be tested. So let's just say if we sum up jujitsu to, you know, let's just say I don't know, chokes, takedowns, back takes, leg locks, and arm bars, right? Let's just say five things. And if leg locks I'm at eighty percent and everything else I'm at forty, and I spend a hundred percent of my time on leg locks my 80% might go to 85 or even 90, but my total average of other five categories is still gonna be fairly low versus if I spend you know, half my time on all the other attributes and get that 40 to 60 or 70%, my cumulative game gets a lot better. So I think, I think that's an important right. Uh, right. And uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people uh, say leave your ego at the door, right? Which I think is a very interesting subject because Barry Tonin said it best. He's like, try, try getting submitted 15 times and see if you have no ego. I think where ego applies, we all have ego, right? Because, you know, nobody wants to tap, right? I mean, we all hate that guy that goes, when you're about to tap, and goes like, oh, nice job. We're all oh, switching this way. But I think where, where, I think where ego comes into play is exactly that and saying, hey, you know, we would never say, hey, I'm the best father I can be. I'm done growing. Or I'm the best husband I can be. I'm done growing. So we do that in jiu-jitsu, though, right? No, that's where the ego comes in play. We're like, hey. I got decent leg locks, but guess what? I suck at takedowns. I'm going to learn takedowns to have the complete game. And then I'm going to do takedowns, not necessarily in tournaments, but that's to get better and fuse them in my game. Because that's not comfortable. And the higher you go in belts, like, you know, I'm a brown belt now. So, like, let's just say I take a lazy shot on a blue belt and they catch me with the guillotine, right? right. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of that. But but I actually, Mark told me a very interesting phenomenon. Which is, I, I, I'm, a, I'm not a very good wrestler. And uh, I've been diligently working at it. He was like, "That's okay. If you get choked, it doesn't matter. Just make a make a pick. Just just keep a tally." He's like, "I guarantee you, you won't make it to 500." You know, and I I, I actually do tallies. I I just bought a house and uh, I actually took him up on it. So I've I've in, in, implemented the system. So I keep tallies. Oh. I don't know if you see it, but <laughs> so, so I literally keep yeah some of the techniques. You know. And it's funny, it, in retrospect, it's not really that much. It's gotten better. In fact, um, I was in, um, I was training with Denny a few weeks ago, last time I was in the Bay Area. He was like, wow, your top pressure is a lot better. You know, your head positioning is good. And 
Uh, and uh, so, you know, it makes a difference, but that's where the ego comes into play. I don't think the ego comes into play, you know, like, oh, I never tap or, you know, whatever. It's, it's the ego component is about self and about being able to be naked in terms of saying, hey, I'm good at this and that's good. And I'm going to work on this thing that sucks. And even though I'm a brown belt, I'm going to strip myself of the pride and get better overall because that does it. You know? that's, so. Yeah, that's certainly true. Well, um, well, there you brought something else up a while back that I want to hit on, and we actually talked about it when we rolled when we rolled together. And, and my my audience would not forgive me if I didn't if I didn't bring this up, and that is the tr the crossover training from uh, from Wing Chun to ju to Jiu Jitsu, mm -hmm. uh, because when I was rolling with you, um, you know, afterwards you said, "Oh, I had a background in Wing Chun." I said, "Well, I didn't know if you noticed, but I was using a lot of sticky hands when when we were rolling." And you said, "Yeah, I kind of thought maybe, you know, because I didn't tell you. I just said, well, 'Well, I'm a blue belt,' you know, and you sure, sure. rolled me on that level." Um, and then you said, yeah, and like, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. You had to talk to a lot of people and stuff, but you basically made the comment, yeah, I still use Wing Chun, a lot of Wing Chun in my rolling. Mm -hmm. Could you, let's go into that a little bit. Like, Sure. Uh, you know, I mean, look, sticky hands, basically at the end of the day, what it is, it's reaction, reaction, right? Um, I, so, I, so I think, and, and, you know, the center line going down the middle, going with the pressure, going against the pressure. Is very similar to the Japanese judo, which is kazushi, right? Or or creating a disruption, meaning like tree off balancing, basically is how it translates into English. And so, for me to get something decent going in jiu-jitsu, I need to off balance you. Um, and sometimes that means manipulating your body weight. Sometimes it means misdirecting your hand, stiff arming, or 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 doing whatever. And so, uh, really, if you think about it, high level wrestling and high level jiu-jitsu, especially in gi really becomes with gripping, right? And so gripping is really hand fighting, if you think about it, which is really shisa or sticky hands. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because Japanese have the saying, if someone pushes, you pull, and if someone pulls, you push. And it's the same thing in jiu-jitsu. You create a momentum one way, you go the other, you disrupt the balance. And so I find myself hand battling for, for down blocks or for to win the pummels, um, which that's like, in my mind, that's the most underutilized uh, part of jiu-jitsu is the hand battles, right? Uh, it's sticky hands. So I think absolutely I still use them. Um, I think obviously I modify because, you know, it's it's how they're practiced that's different, but the concepts apply, mm -hmm. right? So, right. Um, so so absolutely. So I think I, I think that's absolute key. Yeah, I, I use it quite a bit. And, you know, and coming from a varied martial arts background, there are always certain things that carry over from martial art to martial art, and there are certain things that, that don't. Uh, right. And one of the things that that carried over from Wing Chun into uh, Jiu Jitsu was was that that sensitivity of being able to follow a person, yep. where I didn't have to go through that kind of awkward where I just kind of lay on somebody and don't know how to follow base or whatever. But mm -hmm. because I had learned to follow the body through center line and through just yep. you know following that center line through touching hands. And learning not to not to like just hold on to something or something like right. that. Not to to fight force with force, things. Right. Yeah. I mean, I let it go. On style for the basic hand grip, you know, where you go. I, I, I don't know if you can see this, but if someone holds yeah. your hand, most people break it out this way. Versus, yeah. I learned this from Mark. You go into it, right? And so that yeah, right. comes when you're in guard, when they're holding your hands or trying to pry it open, where you break a grip that way. Uh, you know, bong sao, same thing when you turn. It's I, I use that uh, on a back step as I'm passing, you know, and so. Uh, you know, because they're pushing into you, you back step, you, you pass out this way. So so there's a lot of principles. You obviously have to modify them because in, when you practice, uh, you know, even BOG, it's, it's a little more it's a little more static. So, but uh, yeah, no, 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 the principles are there. It's creating an angle, cutting it, you know, so, um, and not fighting force with force, you know. And, and like I said, it's in, it's in grappling. I just think we, like... You do something long enough, you're exposed to the truth. And we figured out long enough, you have to off balance person to get them to go where you need them to, right? Otherwise, right. it doesn't work. You can't fight force with force or it's a losing proposition. Right. You have right. To and, then, and then the whole idea that carries over too is uh, submission before position, or position before submission, sorry. Yep. Submission, position before submission. And it's true in Wing Chun. In Wing Chun, you're not just tagging somebody with hits 
you're actually controlling the center line through mm -hmm. the hand manipulation and off balancing them and then once they're off balance and you have the the position you can hit them if it's you know, sure at, it's at will. Yeah, no, absolutely yep so it's no, the I same it's it's like okay i'm not battling to strike at you just to strike at you and i'm not battling to just get an arm bar i'm i'm battling to get you in a bad place in which the arm bar or triangle or whatever presents itself right well that's the highest that's the highest sort of mastery of the art right there's where you can where you can take whatever is sort of given to you right that's the highest you know if i have to force my game up on you that's great but then you're just a bully right i mean it's, mm -hmm. it's that makes sense so yeah you're you're absolutely the highest form of mastery is i think where you take what's given to you, where you don't go into it having a, you know, like this is what I'm going to do. You're just going to react how it, you know, because you can't, like one key doesn't fit all all locks, right? And so I think, uh, you know, I mean, you can certainly bully everybody because I look at jujitsu like life, man. That's, that's how I look at it, right? Because it's very, someone called it, I don't know who, but they said jujitsu is really, or any grappling for that matter, it's just really problem solving under X. Uh, excruciating circumstance, right? There's someone's riding you, someone's choking you out, and you're problem solving. So right. for me, jujitsu is uh, like life, because in life, you know, sometimes, man, you're on top, and that's what you want on jujitsu. You want to be on top. You want to have somebody feel your weight. But guess what? Sometimes you're on the bottom, and life mm -hmm. sometimes gives you the cards. People get divorced. They don't pass the exam. They lose a job. They do whatever. So sometimes you got to take a breath and work out of whatever position you're in, whether you're bottom, side control, whatever it is. Um, and and sometimes you're on top. We aim to be on top, but we practice what happens if you're on the bottom. And so, um, you know, I, I think you can't have – just a approach, right? You can't be a bully and go, you can bully a lot of people, but eventually someone's gonna out bully you, right? And so the best, most successful people are well-rounded people that read and recognize the set of circumstances and make the best appropriate choices with the facts that are given. And it's the same thing with Jiu Jitsu, right? I can force my way, but then someone else is gonna force their way on me, right? <laughs> Versus right, take right. So, absolutely. So, so I'm, I'm gonna tell you a little story mm -hmm. and, I, and, and, and I want, I want your 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 opinion on it. Uh, okay. It's a, a Did you say your opinion or opinion. <laughs> <laughs> are you going into the bathroom or are you going out of the bathroom? Oh, I like it. I like it. I'm a Russian. <laughs> oh, <laughs> or out of it. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so, um, and it has to do with a personal breakthrough that I've had recently. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I want to talk about maybe a couple of your breakthroughs in your training where you kind of just something snapped in your head and you went, Oh, wow. I, I discovered something that are, I, I, you know, there was a wall and I was hitting it and I went beyond. So mm -hmm. this happened to me recently and it was just, it was kind of odd. Um, right. Basically I'm fairly new blue belt, blue belt for about six months. And this really only happened like the last couple of weeks. Up to this point, I've really just felt like a white belt who knew a lot of techniques. Mm -hmm. That's really what I felt like. I mean, and I really, that's about the only real distinguishment, you know, is it's like, okay, you're a white belt and you're a blue belt. That means that you've learned, you know, X, Y, and Z. You learn arm bar, you learn this, and you can do it, you know, in a fairly short amount of time. You don't have to sit there and think about it. You can throw it on. So I really kind of felt like a white belt who knew a lot of techniques. That's basically the best way I can put it. I could win against other white belts, but, but no, not always. And, uh, you know, low percentages, high percentages, some nights, but basically kind of what put me over the top was just the fact that I knew some stuff that a white belt doesn't know. But like, oh, and this is literally like probably maybe three weeks now, white belts started to feel like another belt. Mm -hmm. They actually started to feel like I was just like, oh, I, you know, like they didn't feel the same. I didn't, I didn't feel like I just had a technical advantage over them. I felt like I could actually you know, put an arm bar on when I wanted to put an arm bar on or reverse something when I wanted to reverse something, mm -hmm. you know, and it was a, a personal breakthrough that I had in jujitsu. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's probably my first, the only reason I'm talking about is because like, it's my, it's my first real big breakthrough that I've actually had that I can look back and go, wow, that was, that was pretty good. But I wanted your opinion on that. And I wanted you to maybe talk about some of your own breakthroughs and yeah. what you've seen with other people. Yeah, man. I mean, I think uh, I can share a couple of personal ones, but I, I think I know what you're talking about, right? Because there's this. So I have a lot of opinions on things, and I always put this as a 
as a disclaimer, right? Just because it's my opinion now, it may not mean that it won't change later, right? Because right. people have varying degrees of truth, right? What you think of truth at five years is different than when you're a fully grown adult, which is different. So same thing in belts, right? So my truth today may not be my truth tomorrow, but I'd like to think with the experience on the mats I have and some of the people I'm exposed to, it holds pretty well. So I would separate the the breakthroughs to physicals and uh, physical and mental. So I think what you're talking about was probably a physical sort of when it just clicks or when it's in the zone. I've had a few competition uh, sequences like that. I remember distinctly uh, a tournament uh, as a white belt, actually. I don't, I swear, I, I, I don't do drugs. I'm not on anything. And man, that was my, like, I think it was my second or third jiu-jitsu tournament. And I swear that time slowed down, man. I was able to like anticipate what the person was doing and like see it coming. And it felt like I was doing it slow motion. And so I think what, what you're probably experiencing is, is that, that, that um, man, perfect timing with perfect application of techniques with perfect setup where it just sort of feels effortless, right? It's like if I played basketball with Michael Jordan, I'd make him look really good, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> how happy I am, right? And so, right. so I, think, I think when you have a certain amount of reps and a certain amount of practical experience, and I think they might have been the moves that naturally you gravitate to. Right, because you have body types, different leverages, different applications, and so there's some submissions that work better for certain body types than others. And so I think you might be talking about convergence and all of, of all those things. Um, and I think we all have experiences, different times. Um, and uh, man, there's not no better feeling than like, you know, when when you practice and rep a technique and then you hit it live, you know, and then you hit it consistently live. Right. And so I think absolutely that's an important one. But I think more so than physical, right? Um, breakthroughs, the, the mental ones are, man, the scariest because they, that is the biggest, um, the biggest sort of deterrent from peak performance. And I'm learning more of this about me. I'm actually going, undergoing an experiment right now as we talk about it. So I'll give you two, two, two of mine that I've learned. So okay. one, or, or maybe I'll give you three. They'll be really quick. So I, I, uh, so, um, so after 30, like I said, I had a corporate career that, that I spent a lot of time at, and I was 31, and Denny, uh, I had just gotten my blue belt, I'm 35 now, and Denny's like, hey man, I think you should do the Worlds this year, and I beat you Jeff Worlds. And I'm like, Denny, I'm 31, I, you know, I, you know, <laughs> you know, I can't, I get too old, I'm a blue belt, like, ah, it's okay, there's kids that sleep on their mom's couches, they do this full time, and you know, and, and he looks at me, and uh, he goes, I, I swear, I, I, like it was yesterday, man. And it changed my life. He goes, who are you? Then I'm like, I'm Gregor Strockel. And he goes, no, you're a nobody. And I was like, okay. He's like, I'm a three-time world champ telling you what you can do, and you're telling me why you can do, why you can't do it. So he's like, maybe you should just shut up and do it. And <laughs> you know, I'm like, hmm. You know, when no one believe, if you don't believe in yourself, have other people that believe in you, right? And so then what do you say, right? So then I had to strap on to do it. And guess what? I took nationals that year and I won, oh, sorry, I took second um, at uh, IBJJF Worlds at Master One, which was 30 to 35. And, and, and same thing to Purple, right? So then I was like, okay, well, maybe I'm good at the 30 to 35 group, right? And so I started competing in that a whole bunch. And then I got my brow belt. And then... I was uh, started training more and, and treating that more seriously. And I started first first few tournaments at brown belt I lost, but that's normal. You know, someone might be at the end of their brown belt journey, about to get black. You just got brown, so there's that there's that gap. But then, um, then it happened was like, okay, um, you should do a goal. That's eighteen to twenty nine. So I'm an executive traveling between two states. Uh, you know, two, three flights a week. And uh, and I was like, wow, that, that that's a big one, you know. But then I did it anyway. And I did okay. I lost in quarters in uh, in the Worlds, but, um, you know. But then recently I had a couple of breakthroughs and uh, won some uh, brown belt tournaments and got invited to EBI trials. And those were all young studs and I'm still competing. I'm um, yeah. at 35, about to be 36. So, so that's what I'm talking. It's the mental breakthroughs, and it was. It wasn't until I I tapped out a, a Brazilian with a straight ankle lock at Brown Belt uh, Worlds, my first match in like I don't know 45 seconds or a minute. That that it kind of hit me. I'm like, well, maybe I do belong. 
you know, uh, at, at that group. But it's like weird because I was never that most confident guy that's like, oh, uh, you know, and I call those the American Idol, you know, it's like people like, oh, I can do anything. Well, no, not really. There should be steer steps, right? Like, you know, not everybody gets to be an astronaut, not everybody gets to be a doctor, right? And then you see these people get crushed on American Idol, but everybody told me, yeah, maybe someone should have told you you sucked, right? Like, I'm glad I got to the acceptance where I belong at Brown Belt, you know, and I still have ways to go, don't get me wrong. I, I mean, I got smoked at Nationals at Brown, right? But, but, uh, but what happens is, you know, there's progressive steps where you're like, oh, you know what, this is where I am right now, and this is where I want to go, and, and you're that up, uh, sort of, that ego that we talked about earlier, it's an objective look and say, if I'm like, oh, well, well I would have been a black belt champ if I, if I could do this and that, well, then go do it, right? So, so I think that's, that, that's probably the, the, the breakthrough, right? And then the last breakthrough I had was a conversation I had with Ricky Landell um, and Mark Brewer. So my two coaches here at the University of Grappling, Ricky Landell's the coach of the UFC, he's the youngest American to get a Gracie black belt. Really great guy, really smart guy. Kind of a yeah, yeah. also Danny, a lot of similar traits. Very interesting. But anyway, so so he said um, he said uh, we were rolling. It was just Mark, me, Chris Johnson, and a good friend of mine training. And he's like, you know, you could be really good in a year. And he's like, I'm not talking like a little good. You'd be really, really good. Like uh, you know, not on a regional scale, but like really good. Um. If, if you gave it a year of proper training and and that stuck with me man i went home and that was six weeks ago you know i went home and i'm like man i'm 36 you know my biological clock's kind of ticking like i you know I, i'm no randy couture i can't do this at 49 right so i got a couple more years and i was like i was thinking about man i'll be 99 and i had a chance i will never know how good i can get unless this is all i do right <laughs> so <laughs> Five weeks ago, quit my job, and I was like, you know what? I'm fortunate enough to have made some smart financial decisions, and and uh, you know, I'm not a big thrifty spender, and I'm pretty low key, and uh, so I don't have to do anything for a while, and I'm so I'm just traveling and painting, um, just so that I can know what how good I can get, um, and I have a pretty specific goal because uh, I think that's another important piece is being able to quantify, right? If you can't quantify what you want, it's very tough to go after something, right? Uh, and I think realistically. Uh, man, you know, I think I can do a lot better than I'm doing, um, and that's great. Um, but man, I just want to have some good, uh, good goals, hard goals with some of the better guys out there, right? Um, that are right there, you know. I, I think if I can hang with them or give them a great match, that'd be great because it's the last sport where you can compete with God of our sport. You can, mm -hmm. you know, you can't go play basketball with Kobe Bryant. Right. You know, I can probably not get to wrestle Gary Tonin, but I'm pretty close to it, meaning, you know, like do well in some of the tournaments and, you know, and I'm not saying that's the plan. <laughs> not saying I'm that good, but I'm just saying I'm, I'm probably two layers removed versus say seven or eight or however many it is in basketball. Right. right. So that's what I'm right. saying. So I think, and there's a lot of guys that are, that are good from down here, that squad or Templana that are coming up, you know, that, that, uh, man, just to compete next to them would mean uh, would mean a ton, and 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 that's cool. And that's I just want to see how good I can really get. And uh, you know, age is really not a factor. It's a limiting factor. So I think those are like the two, uh, the two major breakthroughs. You know, so like the physical and the mental, I think are important. Um, and I don't know if that makes sense or not, but it's it's no, basically absolutely. against anything that society would tell you to do. Um, mm -hmm. But man, I mean, it absolutely makes sense. But absolutely makes. Sense. Okay, glad, I'm glad. I mean, hopefully the audience can appreciate it. But that that was something that uh, that was a lot of time spent, you know, because because man, you lose some of these matches, you're like, why am I doing this? I'm 36, or I'll be 36. Why should I? You know, am I? Is this the right thing to do? <laughs> Executive making good money, right. Right? Yeah. it's not, you know. And uh, but ultimately, you can't take that to the grave, you know. And, and uh, man, what a great match! Right. right. Well, we're coming up on time here. And I want to ask you one final question that I ask all my guests, and that okay. is, what is your top three fight tips or training methods? So what are okay. your top three are pieces of advice, you know, kind of a thing listening for people out there and you say, hey, you want to get better at yep. jujitsu or martial arts in general. What are your top three training tips or fight tips kind of a thing? So I, I would say, and this is a lot of time I spend on, teach, 
okay, teach lower belts, teach whatever. If you can teach the technique, you truly understand it and understand the intricacies of it. That said, though, technique can only be expressed through a proper medium, meaning if you have a car that's not well taken care of or has crappy tires, will never reach full potential. So physical training, whether it's uh, it, particularly Olympic lifting, aligns your body, fixes idiosyncrasies and deficiencies that are developed through high specialization like jiu-jitsu. And, and that allows you to express proper athletic positioning. So I would say that. And, and then three is quantify and have specific goals in mind, which involve your personal growth in terms of whatever it is that you want to do in jiu-jitsu. You know, quantify it. I want to do this tournament and this is the result I want to achieve. Or I want to squat this much, whatever it is. Be able to quantify it or describe it and feel it. But then also have a feedback loop where people can give you uh, 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 an objective feedback of where you are, where they're not blowing smoke up your proverbial hiney because <laughs> that happens so much in jiu-jitsu, right? It's just, you, you should, you know, like don't dream that you're going to be a world champion, but you can win a local Naga, right? Uh, and vice versa, you win a local Naga, it doesn't make you a world champion either. You know what I mean? And so you got to be right. able to, to, to have that and, and have people give you that. So I think those would be my three pieces of advice. And have fun, I mean, four, I guess. Now, hang on, I think I missed one of them. So number one was, was teach. Teach, because that's that how you truly understand was, the technique. Right. And what was the second one? Yeah, the second one was uh, physical training, meaning uh, okay. you know, get your body in shape so that you can express yourself. For the, the techniques you teach can be expressed fully, right? Meaning, and, and, yeah. And then okay. the third, All right. and then the third, the third one was was um, quantify it, or basically it's like goal setting kind of a thing. Yeah, Make describe sure it like... short term, long term, mid term. Yep, absolutely. And have fun with All it. Right. That's right. Oh, you you heard it. You heard it here, folks. I want to thank everyone so much for joining me on the Empty Cup podcast. Thank you, Greg. Could you tell people where to get a hold of you, like if they want to set up for seminars or you know uh, things like that? Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. How do people get a hold of you? Yeah, they um they have uh, I have my Instagram. It's uh, SF Meets EU. So SF for San Francisco, Meets as in Meet, and EU as in Europe, because that's where I'm from. Or uh, also my Facebook under my pseudonym, which is Gregory uh, Strockwell, S T R A Q U E L. Um, also, you can find me at University of Grappling in in Salt Lake and at Ten Planet San Francisco. Um, I train in Bay Area usually twice a week, two times a uh, two sorry two weeks a month and two weeks in Utah. So. Cool. Right on. Well, thank you so much for joining me today and stay with us. Uh, I'm going to close out the show and then just stick with me and I'll talk with you off the air for just a second. Absolutely. Appreciate Thanks everyone it. for listening to the Empty Cup podcast. If you like what you heard, you know what to do. Uh, push that share button and share it on your favorite social media. Help us get the word out and also write a review in iTunes or Stitcher Radio or Podcast One or wherever you heard this, please write a review and uh, that helps people find the program. And you're always welcome to follow us at uh, the Empty Cup Podcast on Facebook and at Empty Cup Pos Podcast on Twitter. And if you're really adventurous, you're going to be able to uh, uh, join me at my YouTube channel at Ronin JKD. Go there. And that's actually where I upload like my training tips and my fight tips. And I do a martial vlog on there where I just kind of talk about ideas that occur to me and things like that or evaluation of systems and things like that. So if you're interested in hearing some of my more personal thoughts and looking at some of my, my sparring competitions and things like that, head on over there uh, and subscribe. So until we meet again, thank you everybody. And please keep your gloves up.